Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Jesus, Holy Spirit. God, we sit here and we listen to you today. With heavy hearts, we come from this week's struggles. Maybe we've blown it this week. Maybe we've sinned. Maybe we fought our spouse on the way to church with the kids screaming in the car. Maybe we've received bad news this week. Or maybe we received good news this week. May we be able to focus on you, Lord. May we push back whatever is trying to tempt us to distract our thoughts. And may we hear from your Holy Spirit, Jesus. Not my words, but your message that's unique for each and every person in this room, God. I know I'm a sinner. But I thank you, God, that you give each and every one of us grace, undeserved forgiveness. And we accept that, we ask for that, and we move forward confidently knowing that you love us. We pray this in no other name than Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, we all have a past, don't we? We all have a past, and some of us have a past that we wish didn't exist. Some of us have a past that doesn't stay in the past. And some of us feel like our past is following us around everywhere we go. Some of us are nervous that our past is not gonna stay in the past, but it's gonna hold back the future. And what if I was to tell you that no matter what has happened to you, no matter what you have done, and even though you can't go back in time and change your past, God today wants to give you hope, purpose, and wants to do a comeback miracle in your life. Today we are continuing our series called Kingdom Logic, and throughout this series we are looking at God's logic, not our own logic. And sometimes we want stuff our way, and God goes about it a different way. And so many of us have something going on in our life or have a past in our life and we want God to do something big in our life and we have a way of thinking about it. What we would like to see God do if only he was our magic genie. And so hopefully throughout this series, we are gonna be unpacking exactly some of the ways that God operates and that we can expect him to do a good work in our life. And so if you're here today and you struggle with the past, you're here for a good message I don't think you're here by mistake because the Bible study we're going to lean in today is just about that. So without any further ado, let's jump into our scriptures today. If you brought your Bibles, go ahead and turn to 2 Kings chapter 5. If you didn't bring your Bibles, don't worry, we'll have the verses on the screen. Now, last time we were in this section of scripture, two weeks ago, we talked about a biblical character named Naaman. Some of you remember him? For those that weren't here today, let me catch you up on the story. Naaman was a powerful, powerful commander-in-chief of military troops, the top dog in his kingdom. Like him and the king were besties because when you have a lethal weapon and it helps you defeat other armies, you keep that close if you're king, right? And so this guy, Naaman, he was popular, he was famous, he was rich, he had a family, he had power. He had it all. He had a reputation of winning, and he had that reputation for a good cause. Because when he came into town, you shook in your boots because you knew you were going down. Naaman's here to destroy you with his troops. Until Naaman came down with the disease. He caught the condition leprosy. Leprosy is a disease that starts at the skin and opens up in sores, but eventually attacks the nervous system and causes your like appendages and arms to shrivel up a little bit. It can cause your ears and your nose and your fingers actually to start to fall off. And eventually, you die. And at that point in history, there was no cure for leprosy. And it was highly contagious. And so if you caught leprosy in biblical times, you were to quarantine. 
but not like how COVID quarantine goes down where you stay in your home and you isolate. No, that's too dangerous. They didn't want you in the city. You had to go outside the city and live with all the lepers, the other people who had the same disease as you. So here we have this rich, powerful, famous military commander in chief guy. And he realizes he has leprosy. And leprosy means he's going to lose his career. He's going to lose his fame. Money won't do any good because he can't get in contact with people to spend it. He won't be able to see his family anymore. And he's freaking out. What am I going to do? And then he hears word that over in Israel, that there's a prophet that can heal him. So as the story went that we talked about a few weeks ago, there's a lot of nuance to it. I'd encourage you to go back to the message we listened to and we unpacked it in detail. Naaman goes eventually to the prophet Elisha and Elisha sends his messenger out, Gehazi, to tell him what to do to experience healing. Go wash in the Jordan River seven times and you'll be good. And that's exactly what Naaman does. I mean, there's more to the story, but that's another sermon for a few weeks ago. So he's healed. And Naaman comes back and he is so happy, so appreciative, that he wants to pay the prophet for doing this good work for him, of healing him of this disease. He did the impossible. Now Naaman's rich, so rich that he wants to give lavish wealth to them and it won't even impact the way that he lives daily and Elisha is like nah I'm good it's not the Lord's will that I take your wealth here you be a good boy go back to your country and try to honor God to the best of your ability I'll see you later and so he sends him on his way back to his own country and then Elisha goes inside and we have Gehazi standing there and his jaw is on the ground. I can't believe that just happened. Now you would think that he's thinking, I can't believe I saw a miracle take place and this man was healed. But Gehazi's got a problem. He wants something. He wants wealth. He wants resources. And he sees a prime opportunity to get wealth and resources right here. And his master, the prophet, just sent him out. That was our chance of living large. What are you doing? Do you understand that? How the, we could upgrade these digs with that kind of money. We could dress differently. We could have different rides of camels and cattle and whatnot. This could be a game changer for us. And that's where we pick up our story, where Gehazi starts to decide that he is going to go after that wealth. 2 Kings chapter 5, verse 20. Gehazi, the servant of Elisha, the man of God, said to himself, My master, my master, the prophet, was too easy on this Naaman, this Aramean, by not accepting from him what he has brought. As surely as the Lord lives, I will run after him and get something from him. So Gehazi ran after him. And when Naaman saw him running toward him, he got down from his chariot to meet him. Pause. Can you go back to the last slide for a moment? Okay. As surely as the Lord lives, here's what's happening. Gehazi's got greed on the mind. He wants that money. He wants those resources. And what is he doing here? He's making it sound pretty spiritual by throwing God's name in there. I know Christians never do that, right? We've never thrown God's name into a bad decision to make it sound a little bit more spiritual. I've never had someone in my office who's breaking up with their spouse and say, well, God just wants me to be happy. And that's the reason why I'm divorcing my spouse. I, I've never had that happen in the church. Mm -mm. We've never thrown that. God just wants me to be able to upgrade my house and my car to the biggest and best. And if the bank approves it, then obviously that means God's blessing it. Is he? So here's a side note lesson. Sometimes we have to be careful because we can throw God's name around and misuse God's name to get what we want when maybe God wasn't ready to give that to you. We're going to start to see that unpacked here. Okay, you can go to the next slide now. 
Okay, so let's just read this verse over again. So Gehazi hurried after Naaman, and when Naaman saw him running toward him, he got down from the chariot to meet him. Why? Because Naaman was rolling deep. He got down from a chariot. He's a man of wealth. He has an entourage with him. He's not just walking back to his city. He is rolling in a beautiful chariot. That's like getting out of an Escalade today, all right? And he sees Gehazi running up next to him. And so Naaman asked, asked him, hey, is everything okay? Is everything all right? And Gehazi responds, everything's good. Everything's all right. My master sent me to say, pause, he's about to misuse his master's name now too, the prophet's name. So he's already misused God's name. He's about to misuse his master's name and he's about to lie. The greed is causing him to choose to step into all types of sin here. So we gotta be careful when, when what we don't, let me say this, we gotta be careful that when we don't get what we want from God, we don't choose to use sin to try to get it anyways, okay? Because that's what's happening here with Gehazi. Let's continue to read. My master sent me to say, two young men from the company of prophets have just come to me from the hill country of Ephraim. Please give me a talent of silver and two sets of clothing. And Naaman responds, by all means, because he's so happy. He feels blessed that he has been healed. He's excited. He's appreciative. Let me bless you back. By all means, don't take one talent of silver, but take two talents. Not one bag of cash, but two bags of cash. And then he urged Gehazi to accept them. And he tied up the two talents of silver into two bags with two sets of clothing. Okay, the two sets of clothing. First of all, we're not talking about two outfits here. We're talking about two sets of wardrobes. And we're not talking Walmart clothes, okay? We're talking like the Gucci and the Prada and the fancy clothes of their day, all right? This is the the clothes that a person like Gehazi wouldn't have access to. So he's, he's coming into some wealth here. Two sets of clothing. He gave them to Uh, the two of his servants, and they carried them ahead of Gehazi. And when Gehazi came to the hill, he took the things from the servants, put them away in the house, and he sent the men away, and they left. So all of a sudden, Gehazi's just come into a whole bunch of wealth. He's got fancy new wardrobes. He's got a bunch of silver. By the way, this isn't just some silver. This is setting up Gehazi, so he never has to worry about money again. This, was, this would be about a million dollars in today's value of silver, estimated. So Gehazi just came into a lot of money. He's thinking, this is a pretty good haul. No harm, no foul. I mean, think of it. Naaman's so rich and powerful... He won't even notice the money's gone, and he wanted to give it anyway. So there's a win right there. My boss didn't want it, so he's good not having it. There's a win right there, and I wanted it. So who does it really hurt that I did this, and I forced it to happen? That is until he came back and saw Elisha again. And he called him out on it. Second Kings chapter 5, verse 25. When he went and stood before his master, Elisha asked him, where have you been, Gehazi? And Gehazi's like, me? Your servant didn't go anywhere. Now what we need to know is he works for the prophet A prophet has a direct connection from God and God's constantly downloading information to the prophet about what God wants the prophet to know about. And God wanted the prophet to know that Gehazi's been a bad boy in doing things and let greed get the best of him and been sneaking around his back. So then Elisha responds. Was not my spirit with you when the man got down from his chariot to meet you? AKA, I'm a prophet, silly. I know what you did. God told me. But then Elisha turns and he starts teaching a lesson to Kahazi right here. And it's a lesson that all of us should take heed to. 
pay attention to, pause and think about. Is it time to take money or accept clothes? Is it the time to take money or accept clothes? In other words, what he's saying here is, yeah, God knows that you want to come into wealth. He knows it. But just because he didn't give it to you doesn't mean you should go get it yourself. Is the timing right? Because if you do this in the wrong motives and you allow greed to win, Gehazi, this becomes a slippery slope. It starts with accepting money and clothing, but then eventually it goes to olive groves and wine vineyards and flocks and herds and male and female slaves. Like eventually you just keep grabbing all of it and you'll just get out of control. You'll let the greed get the best of you. It will continue to grow and fester like an infection. This is a slippery download, down road slope to destruction, Gehazi. Pay attention. And so we've got to ask ourselves this. Is it possible that God hasn't given you what you want because he knows you're not ready for it? Like maybe he wants to give you that, but he knows that at this point in your life, you're not mature enough to handle that. And if he gives it to you now, it will hurt you. It will destroy you. It will hold back the plans that he has for you. Maybe you're just not ready for it yet. We do that to our kids. My 10-year-old loves cars. I'm not giving him keys to the car to drive down the road. He's not ready yet. One day, hopefully, he'll drive a car, but not yet. Should he go take the keys and run to the car and drive anyways? Not unless he wants a whooping. (laughs) All right. Or maybe, maybe God just knows that if he gives that to you, in general, it's not good for you. Your current circumstances and who you are and what you're tempted to do and what that will lead you into, maybe that will break you. And God knows this isn't good for you, and so he holds back. And it's not him holding back like, I just don't want to bless them, I want to be a meanie to them. It's not like that. It's I love them so much that even if I give them what they want, it will hurt them. In the summer, I live in the in Satsuma, and the kids are on their four-wheelers going up and down the streets like crazy in the summer, hauling. I mean, I'm scared to look out the window. No helmets, 30, 40 miles per hour. We're talking blacktop. You'd be goo on the street if something bad happens. And so I don't let my kids play in the street in the summer. Well, all the time, but in the summer especially. Why? Because it's dangerous. Those kids are not paying attention when they're driving around in those four-wheelers. I know it's not good for them. They want to do it. I just hold them back on it. Your heavenly father loves you so much that he's thinking about your best interest. And it's not that he wants to hold back to be mean, but he's holding back because he loves you so much. He wants to give you the best shot possible for you to live a blessed life, a life with purpose, a life following his will and his plans. And he knows that this this might just hurt you. Or you're just not ready to to manage that yet. And that's kind of what's going on here with Gehazi. He's like, you weren't ready for that and you forced it to happen. Verse 27. So then the consequence for Gehazi doing something wrong kicks in. Naaman's leprosy will cling to you and to your descendants forever. Then Gehazi went from Elisha's presence And his skin was leprous, and it had become white as snow. Gehazi made one bad decision, and now he has to spend the rest of his life paying for that, having that consequence follow him around. Some of us resonate with that. We made one bad decision. And now it follows us around for the rest of our life. You might be wondering about your finances. When will the bad decision that I made about my finances stop 
following me around. Maybe you made a bad decision when it came to your sexuality and you did something and now you feel this consequence is there forever. Maybe it's in your relationship and the person you were engaged to or dating isn't interested anymore or the person you were married to, the marriage now looks bleak. It's struggling. You're wondering, how did... How do we get unstuck? You realize the sin has put you in the hole, but you're wondering, how do I get out of that hole? And every day, you feel like you're paying the consequence for some past sin, some past thing that you did. You understand what Gehazi is going through right here. You know, I have a past too. And if you were to examine my past, you would find addiction, uh, crazy amounts of debt, uh, a divorce, codependency. I mean, those are just the headliners. So there's other things in there too. For example, I fell in love with a girl that was the life of the party. She was the one that everybody paid attention to at the bar. I fell in love with her, and I married her in my 20s. And she, at one point in her life, used to follow Jesus, but at that point, not so much. And she had a lot of guy friends. You know, the friends that are her friends that are guys, but they're not your friends. You're not allowed to be friends with them. They don't want to be friends with you. They only want to be friends with her. You know where the story's going. Eventually, one of those guy friends were no longer a friend, but they were more than a friend. And eventually, she'd run off and start a family with one of those guy friends. And there I was in my 20s, divorced. Now, I know we have a lot of friends in a room that have gone through a divorce or going through a divorce or have a loved one of someone who's gone through a divorce. And divorce is not easy. But it's different when you're in your 20s. And us older folk might be thinking, well, they're in their 20s. They've got their whole life ahead of them. That's good, right? Like, act like it never happened and move on. No, that divorce is on my permanent record. There's no acting like it's not there. It's there forever. And it's interesting because it's unique when you get a divorce in your 20s. You see, when you're in your 30s, at least your late 30s, your 40s, People assumed you, uh, assumed you gave it the old college try. You tried your best. <laughs> Something happened, and we get it. Life is tough. But when you're in your 20s, they look at you and say, what'd you do? How did you break this? You must be damaged, damaged goods. Because if you can't make it three, five years, maybe you should just sit this one out. Maybe marriage is not for you. And people will judge you. And you only can hear judgment so long until your flesh lets it seep in to affect your self-esteem and the way that you think about yourself. And so I could see this story, and part of me resonates with Gehazi too. Some bad decisions that I made led to some terrible consequences. I should have picked someone who was following Jesus, but was I following Jesus? No. No. Now, thankfully, through that divorce, it caused me to rededicate my life to God because, well, I tried it the world's way, and that left me broken, hurt, messed up. So let's give it the try of Jesus' way and see if it's any better. And I can tell you, it's coming later on in a message. It's way better Jesus' way. You might feel like you're always going to be in debt. You might feel like you're always going to be a failure. You might feel like Gehazi at this point in the story. Like that consequence is going to follow him around for the rest of his life. You know, that irreversible consequence, it could lead to despair. But don't forget that we worship a God of miracles. Okay? And just because the world's judgment, just because your own judgment can look down on you, 
doesn't mean that God's plans have ever stopped for you. It might have changed. He might be regrouping, retooling, building new plans for you, but it's not the end. And this leads me to our next fill in here. God knows how to bring about a miracle even in an irreversible situation. You might feel like your situation is irreversible. That marriage, you're thinking to yourself, is never going to come back. And it might not. But that doesn't mean God won't do a miracle in your life. You might never get that house back that you lost and foreclosed on, but that doesn't mean that God won't do a miracle in your life. God can do miracles in our lives, even in an irreversible situation. Let's go back to our friend Gehazi. He's got leprosy, but if you fast forward three chapters later, he's standing in front of the king with leprosy. Um, The way it worked in the Bible is if you had leprosy, you're not to come in contact with people who didn't have leprosy, especially the king. You are to live outside the city, and if anyone came your way, you're to say, unclean, unclean, I'm sick, I'm a leper, get out of here. You're to scare people away. You don't even get to use your name anymore. It's not like, hey, my name's Chris. I'd love to be your friend, but I'm kind of sick, so stay away. Maybe one day I'll get healed if there's a miracle. No, it's like, stay away. You don't want what I got. It impacts who you are. How did he get in front of the king? Well, because we worship a God of miracles, of course. So here's what happens. Let's talk about what goes down here. So Samaria is hit with a famine. There's no food. People are starving. This is the area that they live in, by the way. People are so hungry that they're buying dove dung off each other. Yeah, bird poop. They're buying it off each other because the dove sometimes doesn't digest all the grain. And if that dove can fly away to a land with food, eat, and then fly back over here, maybe I can get a little bit of grain out of their dung. How hungry do you have to be to eat that, to dig through that? to buy that, and there might be a chance there's nothing even in it. Pretty desperate, right? I mean, we're talking about a town that is starving to death. People are dying around them because they're not eating. So much so that desperation kicks in in a way where they start thinking crazy thoughts, like, you know, I'm going to die, you're going to die of hunger. I mean, if we're both going to die, how about I eat you? They became cannibals. In fact, the scriptures talk about how they started eating their children. You have to be pretty desperate to want to eat your child. And that's the people in town that had resources. Imagine the lepers outside of town. How did they eat? Well, usually they go through the garbage and the cast-offs. But if the city can't eat, there's no food in the garbage. There's no cast-offs. So they're just as desperate, if not more desperate. And so there's four leprous men sitting at the gate entrance and they're kind of looking at their options and going through it. Okay, they're like, number one, we can stay here and we'll die of hunger. Okay, that's option one. Option two, we can go into town and die of hunger because there's no food in town. That's option two. And if people are going to die anyways, what's the matter if I have leprosy? So that would be option two. And then option three is the reason the famine's here in the first place. You see, a huge army came to that town and it cut off the food supply. And they decided those people will not eat and we'll get them all nice and weak and let them die. And so the lepers decided the third option looked pretty good. They'll probably kill us if we go over to that army, but there's a chance they might feed us. There's a chance we might live. The other two doesn't look like we have a chance of living. And so the lepers decided, if we're going to die anyways, we might as well die trying. What a lesson we can learn from that. Your situation and your consequences and what is going on in your life that seems heavy, you've got some options. You've got some decisions to make. Do you sit back and let the inevitable take over and succumb to your circumstances? Or do you get up and start doing something? 
These guys thought, what do we have to lose? Let's get up and do something. And so they started to move in faith that there might be an opportunity for them to eat in the enemy's camp, in that military's camp. And so they started to walk. Friends, don't forget the powerful words that are found in 1 John chapter 4. You, all of you, belong to God, my dear children. You have already won a victory over those people because the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. Here's what this means for you today. No matter what you are facing, no matter how big your problems might be, no matter how disastrous your past might be, Jesus is bigger. The Holy Spirit is more powerful than your past. And we got to stop living like it's going to kill us and stop sacrificing ourselves to our lack of faith and start getting up and moving forward in faith and expecting God to do something in our life. We'll keep learning this lesson. Let's keep looking at what happens here. Chapter 7 in 2 Kings goes on to say this. So those lepers got up and they started going towards that army. At dusk, they got up, and when they went to the camp of the Arameans, they reached the edge of the camp. No one was there, for the Lord had caused the Arameans to hear this sound of chariots, horses, and a great army. So they said to one another, "Um, uh uh-oh, look, the king of Israel, I think he's hired the Hittite and the Egyptian armies to attack us. Their kings are going to send their troops. So they got up and they fled in the dusk and abandoned their tents, their horses, their donkeys, and they left camp and ran for their lives. They ran for their lives. Why? Because God did something supernatural. You know what God did in this story? He amplified their movement. Maybe God's calling you today to get up and do something so he can amplify the movement. And you might be thinking, what's the point? If I go on with my day, if I go to work again, my spouse passed away, they're not coming back. If I go to work, why go to work? My marriage is done. I'm bankrupt. What's the point of trying? The point is you get up and start doing something and allow the Holy Spirit to amplify your movement because he wants to do a comeback miracle in your life. And I know that firsthand because I've experienced this type of a comeback miracle. Again, I'm, in my story with you, I was divorced in my 20s. And that judgment was seeking, seeping in. Who would want to be with me? But I did this great thing. I made the best decision of my life. I started to commit my life to Jesus and live for him, which meant reading the Bible. It meant going to church regularly because I wanted to grow in my faith, not just to go for attendance. It meant I started going to small group because I needed to be surrounded with like-minded Christians that would encourage me and hold me accountable. I started to pray. I started to cut out The bad things in my life, to the best of my ability, went to 12-step meetings to get rid of the addiction to alcohol, worked on the lust, put some accountability software on some computers and whatnot, like started to try to cut the bad stuff out and live for Jesus. And it wasn't overnight that God put me in this place. If you were to look at my life, you'd see my wonderful wife, who is way out of my league, my children, who are better than I could have dreamed of. I get to serve here with all of you and tell you just how good Jesus is. But it wasn't like one day I woke up and had all this. It was me choosing to live day by day through the mess of the consequence, getting up anyways. And I basically would ask myself this question. In this situation, with whatever's happening, with whoever's in front of me, with whatever's in front of me, what does God want me to do here? What does God want me to do with this? 
And little bit by little bit, I started to move in faith. And I've learned that when we move in faith, we open ourselves up for the Holy Spirit to amplify the movement. Guys, this is what I'm trying to say to you. You have to take a step of faith if you're going to hear the Holy Spirit's footsteps behind you. Okay? Some of us want a breakthrough from the Holy Spirit, but we have not taken a step of faith yet. You want a miracle to happen? You want to see God do something in your life despite the past? Get up and let God do something. Remember last week what I talked about. A comeback miracle is a partnership between you and the Holy Spirit. He wants to do the comeback miracle in your life, but you've got a part to play in it. That's exactly what we're saying here. You see, your past might feel like a blemish on your life, but the Holy Spirit wants to turn that blemish into a beauty mark. Talk more about that in a moment. You see, I started to live for Jesus day by day. And as I lived for Jesus day by day, I started to become a man, become a person who someone like my wonderful wife would be interested in. The old Chris, she wouldn't date. The new Chris, well, with a lot of prayer and God's blessing, she gave me a shot. There was a chance. Now, I have a past. Again, divorce, recovery issues. And God put it in my heart that I needed to go to seminary. And I'm like, why, God? I was a special ed kid. I don't need to go to seminary. I was never good at English. And if you don't know Bible degrees, they're basically an English degree with Jesus on top of it, okay? That's all it is. I mean, don't get me wrong, a lot of doctrine, a lot of Jesus, but a lot of writing, reading and writing. Something that I was terrible at. Dyslexic, not my style. And then I was thinking, God, I'm not just a terrible student, but God, I've got a past. Why would I go to seminary? Who would hire me with that past? That future, I don't think it's on the table, God. What are we talking about? Faith, stepping out, letting God amplify your movement. And so, God had already done some of the comeback miracle in my life. He's already putting peace in my heart and bringing great people like Stephanie into my life. So I went to the seminary and I obtained a master's in divinity. And then God started using the blemish of my past as that beauty mark. You see, God can redeem your past by using it to change other people's lives. He wants to change your life. He wants you to have a comeback. He wants to do a miracle in and through you, but then he wants to change other people's lives as well. He used the addict that had to go to the 12-step meetings and had sponsors. He used me to start a recovery ministry. And every Wednesday night, we had over 100 people coming to celebrate recovery, seeking healing for hurts, habits, and hang-ups of all different types of issues. God put it in my heart to bring a marriage enrichment program to the church I was working at at the time. I'm like, God, what do I know about marriage enrichment? I got the divorce in my past. Take steps, get trained, put it out there on the connection card, put a couple Facebook ads out, raise up some leaders, a little bit, a little bit, God's amplifying the movement. I opened the doors of the auditorium, and the first night that we offered that class, I couldn't believe it. We had to have an emergency leader meeting after service that day. 1,000 people walked in the door. God amplifies our movement when we step out in faith. That mark, God wants to make it a beauty mark. But we have to decide, are we going to let God make it a beauty mark? All right, let's get back to our boy Gehazi here and what's happening in his story. So Gehazi and his guys go to the camp and they're like, this is amazing. First of all, that verse said that there was animals there. What does animals equal? 
food. <laughs> I mean, if you're eating bird, bird dung, some, some donkeys look a little pretty delicious at this point, right? I'm sure there was other food there because there were military leaders. They were eating good. So they had food, they had wine, and they feasted. And then they started going tent to tent and seeing all the loot. They found gold and silver and wardrobes and clothing, and they started piling it all up. And they were really excited about how much money that they've just come into. But one of the lepers had a moment of clarity. And he paused and he's like, wait a minute. This feels all too familiar. We can't let greed win. And so he calls the other lepers together and he's like, hey, you know, as great as it is that we grab all this stuff and hog it to ourselves, there's a city over there that's dying of hunger. And we just came into a bunch of food. And this money could really impact that city. I don't think we should keep it to ourselves. We should go tell the king that not only do we have food, not only do we have resources, but the city has freedom again because the army's gone. And that's how Gehazi passed the test the second time around. The first time, he let greed win. The second time, he let God win by choosing to follow God's will for his life. And Gehazi saved the hungry town. And they ate again. And this is my final note to you. When God does a comeback miracle in your life, always remember that it's not just for you. He wants to bless you and do a miracle and help you get past that pain of the past that's in your past. But he also wants to use that pain to transform someone else's life. You want to feel closure for an issue that's in your past? Let God set someone free because of the pain of your past. Watch out. You'll find your newest passion in life. And this is why I open the message by saying, what if I was to tell you that God wants to give you purpose today and hope and a future? And that your past doesn't have to hold back your future. I believe with Jesus... Your past propels you into the future. You don't have to be afraid, but we get to celebrate all that God's doing. Let's pray.